Welcome to the Cave of Eternity. My name is Ryan Freeman. This is a painting by Luca Giordano. It is gorgeous. There are mythological figures scattered across the canvas. And we're going to go ahead and break it down and look at some of the allegories and some of the meanings because I believe there is psychological gold in this painting. As we gaze across the canvas, we notice a cast of characters outside a cave. In the middle, we see a regally dressed bearded man with a crown. Looks like a king, yet if we zoom in to the back of his head, we notice something peculiar. A second face. Two faces. One looking forward to the future, and the other looking backward to the past. This is the ancient Roman god Janus, personification of change. We see that he's holding a fleece out to three lovely ladies. One plucks the wool, a second works it on a spindle, while the third one cuts. Known as the Moirai in ancient Greece, in English we call them the Fates. Their job is to spin the lives of every mortal in the form of thread, determining the length of our lives and how we will die. They are destiny personified. Above them hovers a winged man. On his face we notice a look of defiance and determination, while in his hands, clasped strongly, is a flaming torch. Behold, the titan who stole fire from the gods in order to give it to man, Prometheus. He represents human striving, the quest for scientific knowledge, but also the unintended consequences that come along with defying the cosmic order. Now let's look at the other side of the canvas. In the background we see the cave, symbol of the Great Mother's Womb. Inside the cave looms a figure shrouded in shadow. Who is this? By zooming in as far as we can, we can just make out an hourglass between his right hand and knee. This is Kronos, personification of time. In front of the cave we see a blonde woman whose swollen breasts are leaking milk, a sure sign of motherhood and the provision of life. A green garment sits over her lap, under which we spy infant carpi, known as fruits of the earth. This is nature herself. She appears to be handing a golden orb to a hooded figure. Orbs are considered the perfect shape, for they have no beginning or end, while gold, because of its durability, is symbolic of the incorruptible. This orb is given to a figure known as Demogorgon, who is so mysterious that he or she is covered to conceal their true identity. Demogorgon is a primal deity closely related to the earth and chaos, and can also be seen as the personification of the unconscious. In Demogorgon's left hand is a staff which may symbolize the Axis Mundi, which connects the earth to the heavens. Above is a winged woman who appears both blind and blindfolded. In her right hand is the Wheel of Fortune. That's because she is Fortuna, Roman goddess of fortune and luck. And as the Italians say, La fortuna è cieca. Luck is blind. And finally we come to the massive snake encircling them all. Whenever you see a snake in the shape of a circle swallowing its own tail, you know that you are looking at the Euroboros, symbol of the eternal return. Luca Giordano painted the Cave of Eternity around the year 1685 in Florence. Now, what did he mean by it? Was there some sort of allegorical message he was trying to convey? Did he even know? Or was he possessed by the muses? We'll never know. If you go online, you can find all of the identifications of the individual figures that I just made. But what you cannot do is actually find a satisfying interpretation of the entire canvas. 
until now. I have attempted to connect the dots as an amateur, thinking that mythology and painting is not just for the experts, but for kids as well. So like a big kid, I present my interpretation of the Cave of Eternity to you. Agree, disagree, put it in the comments. Come up with your own interpretation. Put it down in the comments. Let's decipher it together. Without further ado, my interpretation of the Cave of Eternity. So when we look at the canvas, there's something that just jumps out at me, and it's the big contrast between Prometheus and Demogorgon, because as you can see, Prometheus is way up here, up in the sky, and he's got a torch, so he, presumably he can see very clearly, and then when, of course, you think of the very symbolism of Prometheus, which is what, the fire bringer, and um, he's been equated even with Lucifer, Lucifer, the, the bringer of light, and um, he symbolizes consciousness. Uh, he symbolizes the pursuit of science, the pursuit of knowledge, and so it's very apt that he should be illuminating, illuminating the darkness. Whereas down here with Demogorgon, uh, you know, he's down on the ground, and of course he's a deity uh, associated with the earth, so that makes sense. And his, and his face is covered. We don't know if it's a, a man or a woman. He's sort of genderless, um, and uh, he's he's covered. And that's also indicative of, of the symbolism that he symbolizes the unconscious. Uh, and so him and Prometheus are, are striking contrast, not only in their position on the canvas, but also in what they represent. Um, and I think it's very fitting that Demogorgon is actually in communion with nature, right? I mean, they're touching this golden orb, this golden, this perfect shape this perfect shape of wholeness, Demogorgon in nature, and he's also connected with fortune. He's blessed by fortune, and it almost appears that way. And um, it makes me remember what life was like in my earliest days. Now, of course, I would bump my head and cry, and you know, but we do look back at our childhood as sort of idyllic and we feel lucky, we feel blessed, we feel, we love nature, right? Kids love nature unless they're taught to hate it, but kids feel at peace in nature. Kids wanna live in nature. Um, they wanna spend their time outdoors. Well, not these not these days, but generally over the eons, kids just uh, tend to, um, tend to thrive when they're in natural surroundings. And also, if you read the depth psychologists of the 20th century, um, I'm speaking of Carl Jung predominantly, that's one of my main influences, but he talks a lot about how um, there is this wholeness that we experience in our childhood, and we're not at war with our nature. We sort of accept all of our feelings. We don't say some feelings are bad, some feelings are good, so we are, in a way, natural, and I think that's also one of the reasons we find children so beautiful is the fact that they are spontaneous. Well, how, how is someone spontaneous? It's because they're not fighting their nature. So we're at peace with their nature. And Demogorgon, um, the hood representing the unconscious, and if you think back to how little you knew about the world, how little you even knew about yourself, um, even though you accepted yourself, you didn't really know a lot, you know, you, uh, 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 you know, you're still you were taking in information. You didn't necessarily have a massive store of information. So, in in my the way that I view this canvas, um, is that Demogorgon is us in our very primal beginnings, as individuals and as a species. So, as individuals, we're we're at peace with nature, at, at least at peace with our nature. Um, we're not constantly questioning our feelings. Um, we're unconscious of the world around us. We're unconscious about ourselves and, and all of these things. We just accept everything, but we do feel lucky. We feel blessed in hell. We were blessed to even be conceived out of all of your dad's uh, individual sperms. I mean, what were the chances? And of, of all your ancestors that had to make it for you to get here, what were the chances for you to arrive here on this planet? Very lucky to be here. Um, so I believe Demogorgon represents us at our very beginning. Um, either you can imagine at conception um, or 
or as a baby or even as a child. And I think he also represents us, uh, our species, when we first began. Now we have no time machines. Um, and we have to go on the stories that are have been reconstructed by uh, you know paleontologists and historians and ethnologists. But the story that has tended to predominate is that we didn't know much really about the world that we lived in. Um, we were at peace with nature. We knew we had a very uh, strong connection with animals, right? We built shrines to animals. They were parts of our stories. We had totems. We painted their, their likeness on caves. Our lives and our tribes and, and our nomadic movements revolved around animals, um, as well as plants. We, we didn't go to the pharmacy for medicine. We went out and picked various herbs and, and we, we were just very close with nature. Um, you know, she, she, was, she wasn't so separated and we were also closer with our nature. And, and it's harder to, to say that exactly, but from what I have read um, from some psychology is that uh, mental illness, which is largely a cleavage of your personality where you deny one aspect of yourself, where you sort of have an inner war, is mostly a modern phenomenon. Um, that's one of the reasons I think uh, 20th century psychology became so popular, was that it began to address that with Freud and Jung, and, as well as many others. So Demogorgon, to me, represents our humble beginnings, right? Humble, low to the earth, connected with nature, lucky to even be here. What were the chances for our species to evolve and to evolve consciousness and to even exist on this planet? What were the chances? Lucky, very fortunate, and one with nature. Not questioning, questioning nature, accepting nature. That was really what uh, primitive culture uh, was about, which was integration with nature, accepting nature. Um, embracing nature, worshiping nature. We were with nature, right? Now Prometheus on the other side, representing consciousness, representing the advances in them, representing scientific striving, has the torch illumined. He's no, we're no longer in the darkness as a species, right? We, we now uh, send probes across and even out of the solar system. We delve into the molecular biology of our very, of our very selves. But also in doing that, we have sort of divorced ourselves from nature. We have exploited nature. We have we have ground up her minerals. We have deforested uh, many ancient uh, many ancient uh, forests, and and we have destroyed many species. You know how many species have gone extinct simply from the rise of of our civilization, right? And and if Prometheus by giving us the fire and representing that technology and representing that scientific striving and in our striving in our technological progress we have brought light to our minds we have so many books more books than any person could ever read more specializations of knowledge that anyone can follow yet yet look at the destruction where have the fish gone look at all the mercury in the ocean look look at all the disease look at look at all of the destruction that we wrought on nature both externally nature and on ourselves you know mental illness is so rampant now we just kill ourselves because we find life meaningless we're disconnected um we don't we build walls we we watch screens we hardly ever go out and actually embrace nature as our mother and we don't even embrace our nature and so we just numb ourselves with mindless entertainment um, and take pills and busy ourselves with buying shit which comes from the destruction of nature and so that that is our fate right and so I see Janus as us and I see Janus because he represents change and we've gone through all of the changes and we can look at the microcosm where we look back at our lives it was idyllic where we loved ourselves we loved our nature we loved the nature of the people we didn't have until we got taught you know what is good what is bad this is what you need to do this is what you not shouldn't do we were at peace you know you see how innocent and spontaneous babies are you know it's, it's gorgeous and we look back on that but we also look forward to our fate we follow the thread of our fate and where what is the current of our civilization in our lives it's more knowledge it's it's more striving it's more 
it's more exploration and we we enjoy that because it's great to have increased power it's great to have fire it's great to soar into the heavens and yet it takes us further away from the bosom of nature and it takes us uh, further away even from our own nature and um, when we look into the future people talking about AI people like Elon Musk inventing technologies to even uh, integrate uh, cybernetics and, and, and AI with us we are getting further from our uh, mother nature's bosom and so this is our story both as individuals as we go from innocent children to strong powerful conscious woke individuals but almost too conscious right how many of when if you go to really rich areas and and educated areas it's usually those people who actually are the least happy I mean I, I've traveled all around the world been to many many countries been to many places in and out of America um, and you normally do find that the people the peoples who are closest with nature whether you're talking about indigenous tribes in the Amazon or you're talking about even um, even people in more rural areas or poor areas in America they tend to be more spontaneous, happier people than when you go into like even Silicon Valley. You see very self-conscious people, you know, um, and they're rich and they're powerful, but they're not happy. <laughs> and that's they got all the gadgets, they got all the power, they got all the education, and um, but they're too self-conscious. And what what was that? What price have they had to pay to get to where they are? And what price will we have to pay? as our species to get where we're trying to go um, so we are genius we're looking at our future up into the heavens with power and, but we also look back at that uh, primal beginnings yet we see that all is within the Euroboros, the snake which represents the eternal return our past there's an idea that right now in this normal sober state however you want to call it we live within temporal time we have a past and a beginning but there are people like plato people like some of the philosophers who have achieved these altered states of consciousness and there actually is no past or no future it is all one from god's eyes uh lack of a better word let's say the Euroboros, from the Euroboros's eyes from the from if the Euroboros uh stands for the eternal return or even stands for eternity and you know all of these symbols actually have many many more meanings than what I'm trying to convey I'm sort of giving a superficial description of them uh, but I can only make this video go on so long but from the Euroboros's perspective from eternity's perspective there is no past there is no future there is just eternity the cave of eternity by Luca Giordano I hope you enjoyed I hope you got something out of this and I will be bringing more videos to you soon